and share the screen. Go to full screen. Okay, so let us get started. And uh, today, you know, we started discussing fermions last time, and, and now we're moving into the instant interesting example of the fermion dynamics, namely BCS state. So this is just the, the, the repeat of what I said on, on Wednesday. So midterm exam is going to be take home. I'm going to post the problem next Friday and still in a week. And I'm asking you to do all the work on your own without consulting anybody or any machine or whatever. So, uh, you know, it's basically just the homework, but that's something you need to do on your own. And uh, uh, today I will be posting a regular homework problem. So uh, this is get uh, posted the next week. So uh, get back to physics. So we started talking about many, many different systems where the same idea actually work, namely that up to the, the Fermi energy, you fill up all the states that are available uh, using the fermions, uh, one each. And the one example I talked about is nuclear shell model. And so idea is pretty simple. You set up some kind of a, a phenomenological model, which is not easy to justify from, from fundamental principles, but nonetheless, this idea works in terms of explaining what, are, what is so-called the magic numbers in the nuclear physics, namely that if you have certain number of protons, certain number of protons, or maybe both, then you have a particularly stable kind of nuclei, which corresponds to very similar to the idea of the closed shell uh, in atoms. And so I mentioned these energy levels, uh, starting from harmonic oscillator, which is simple to understand. Then you flatten out the potential at long distances so that the sum of the states with large L will come down. And then you, on top of it, you put in the spin orbit coupling so that the levels are prefer to have spins in the orbital angular momentum aligning the same direction. So that's how you can actually explain all these magic numbers and that earned, of course, an overprice to people who post this. And the reason I'm going through this a little bit here is that I'm actually going to use this today uh, for one particular system, namely helium-3. So helium-4 is doubly magic because if you fill this lowest level of the harmonic oscillator, then you can put one proton with spin up, another proton with spin down into that level. So that's two protons. And the same thing for neutron, spin up and spin down. So two neutrons. So you can put two protons and two neutrons to occupy all of the available states at this 1s level. And so that is the very stable nucleus indeed of helium-4. And we'll be talking about helium-3 later on, which means that out of this doubly magic stable nucleus, you are taking one neutron away from it. And as we also talked about uh, on, on, on Wednesday, the taking a state away from this Fermi degenerate C occupying all the way up to uh, Fermi energy, it can be talk, talked about using this idea called hole. So helium-3, we'll be talking about uh, uh, briefly later on, can be considered to be this doubly magic nucleus together with one hole in it. So that's how we can actually understand this property very easily. So that's why I just quickly reviewed the shell model. And then, so we talked about this idea of the hole. So ground state is that all of the states uh, above the Fermi energy are not occupied. All of the states below the Fermi energy are occupied. And so we actually had this kind of a, a diagram that showed all the states up to Fermi momentum or Fermi energy in general are occupied, but above that is not occupied. So the trick we played to uh, use this language of whole is to introduce new annihilation operator, which is actually the same thing as a creation operator with the original language with opposite spin and, spin and momenta. And correspondingly, the new creation operator would be old annihilation operator, again, with the opposite momentum and spin. And for fermions, this is not the case with the bosons, but for fermions, even if you do this funny replacement between creation and annihilation operators, they still satisfy exactly the same anti-commutation relation. So we can define <coughs> the ground state of the system to be the new vacuum state which is annihilated by this new annihilation operator. So the fact that this vacuum state is annihilated by this annihilation operator is the same thing as the state that cannot be no longer occupied by more particles because we did the switch between creation and annihilation operator. 
So that's what we talked about as the idea of the whole, which use, uh, turns out to be extremely useful, again, in many, many different systems. And the whole has opposite charge, momentum, and energy. So putting one particle over here is the creation of a particle, but removing one particle below the Fermi level is the creation of a whole. And so in this case, if you actually decide to move this particle and bring it up to this energy level with higher energy above the Fermi energy, this is actually the pair creation of a particle and a whole. And that's the analogy I'm gonna actually mention later on that this whole is, is very much the same idea of the antimatter particles once we go to relativistic uh, theories. And I mentioned this example by Worth because I was running out of time, but I'm, I'd like to show you a slide here now. So this concept of whole is, is very much essential when you talk about condensed matter physics, especially the semiconductors are called the P-type. And the P-type semiconductor have the charge carriers, which has positive charge. And of course, there's no particles in a semiconductor that carries positive charge that can flow in the system. So this is actually not meant to be a, a electron, but rather a hole of the electron. So if you occupy all the states for the electrons up to Fermi energy level, and if you take one electron away from it, and that's the hole, and because all the properties of a hole is the opposite from that of the particle, so the charge, electric charge of a hole is actually positive compared to the negative charge of the electron, and hence this is p-type positive charge carrier in a semiconductor. So that's very much the, the common thing, a common language we use in this condensed matter physics. Another example I mentioned is the halogen. Uh, so this is actually the seventh group in the periodic table. And this is an an argon is an example of the noble gas in the third row, where you have occupied uh, uh, one nest states with two electrons, two, uh, two SN2 B states with eight electrons, three S and three P states with eight electrons again. So that's an argon atom, that's a noble gas. But compared to this noble gas argon, chlorine, that's one of the halogen elements, uh, has one electron missing. And that's why this is a very chemically active element. And uh, chlorine can easily become a, a, a negative ion by acquiring electron to occupy this state. So that becomes a closed shell. And, and this, of course, you all know this. Um, so one way to describe this chlorine, which has what? Two plus eight plus seven, so 15, 17 electrons. And if you try to write down the wave function of 17 electrons, of course, that's a fairly complicated thing to do. But instead, you can take this attitude that, okay, argon is a closed shell. And the chlorine basically is the same thing as creating a hole in argon because you're removing one of the electrons then you can discuss chlorine atom as a one body problem instead of 17 body problem. So this is basically the same thing as just a hydrogen atom, except that this is now positively charged and all the inner shell electrons and including this outer shell electron, assuming that all eight of them are occupied, will provide just an, a potential energy for this new hole so the potential energy is no longer just a pure Coulomb potential, but it needs to include contribution from all of these other electrons. But nonetheless, it's just a single potential. And you can treat the chlorine atom as if it was just a one body problem of positive particle moving about in that the potential energy. So this is another example where uh, using the language of whole is extremely effective and useful. And here's an example in nuclear physics. Again, I mentioned this once, but I didn't show a slide. So oxygen 16 is one of those doubly magic nucleus. So that is similar to this idea of the noble gas argon. And carbon 14, which is used in this radioactive uh, dating, is, uh, uh, can be understood as having two holes for the proton out of the oxygen 16. So again, you can pretend that carbon 14 is just a two body system moving in this generic potential in the shell model. And the two body problem is a far easier to solve than again, 14 body problem. And that's the way you can understand, for example, what is the spin of that state is? What is the angular momentum of that state is? What kind of excitations you can expect uh, for the carbon 14 atoms and how it might decay. And all of these things can be discussed using this idea of two holes instead of 14 body problem. 
And the last example I already alluded to is that once you go to relativistic quantum field theory, we talk about Dirac equation, where you have a relativistic field equation that describes a spin one half particle, and that you are supposed to occupy all the states which actually happen to have negative energies. So this is the analog of this Fermi degenerate C we were talking about. So all these negative energy states are now occupied. But if you create one particle above this energy level, that's the electron we know and love. But you can also create a hole, namely take one electron away from this Fermi degenerate C, and that creates an excitation which now has a positive energy, just like what we talked about in the case of semiconductor. And this is a state that exists. That's the positron, namely the antimatter particle of an electron. So moving one electron from this negative energy state to a positive energy state is of course excitation of the system, which you can create by sending in a photon, for instance. And so that process then is a pair creation of one electron and one positron. And that's one example we are going to actually discuss later on once we get to relativistic QFT. And we are going to actually even compute the process of how we can create a pair of electron and positron later on. So, okay, so I just summarized what we discussed about the nuclear shell model and the idea of a whole uh, from Wednesday's class. So I stop here if there are any questions. Um, so, so help? could you guys uh, discuss this last part of what are these energy states in uh, the graph you have? Uh, you're talking about this uh, bottom one for the- uh, Yeah, so what, uh, what, yeah, so I guess like before it would be um, like in a metal or in a Fermi mm -hmm. uh, liquid, but I guess if you're talking about antimatter and uh, matter, what I guess ex exactly are we plotting in this? Yeah, yeah, so of uh, course scenario. we come back and talk about this later, but the idea is simply okay. that we have the generalization of the Schrodinger field theory, which is not just Gadolinian invariant, but actually Lorentz invariant. Uh, so that you can describe a relativistic system. And if you do so, that Dirac actually faced this problem when he first proposed this, that, oops, they are solutions with negative energies. And it doesn't make sense what I'm supposed to do with them. And it turned out that Dirac actually came up with this ingenious idea that, well, you know, these are fermions after all. So if you occupy all of these negative energy states, then we don't have negative energies anymore. We can occupy these states anymore. And so his assumption was that our universe is actually this, with all the negative energy states occupied. And so if you accept that idea, then you know, immediately you have this idea of the whole. And so Dirac eventually came up with this prediction that a positron should exist before it was actually discovered in Cosmic Ray uh, experiment by uh, Anderson from Caltech. So he basically predicted based on this relativistic field equation that antimatter should exist. And that was eventually discovered. So that's the idea of this energy levels I drew in this cartoon down here. Does that answer your question, Sahil? Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Okay, and, and again, we'll come back and talk about the Dirac equation later on. Any other questions on this subject? Uh, yes, I have a question. Okay. Like from this picture, uh, it seems like the number of uh, positron and electron uh, should be the same, but uh, in our world, it's, it seems clearly that we have more electrons than positrons. How can we like, explain it, this? Phenomenon? Yeah, that's an excellent, excellent question. And that is actually one of the major mysteries about the universe as we see it. So how come that there are electrons in the universe, but no positrons, basically? And we don't have an answer to that yet. And there are many different ideas about it but we don't have an answer to that question. And that is the question called baryogenesis or matter-antimatter asymmetry. So I guess the second terminology makes sense. There is matter in the universe, but no antimatter practically. So there's an asymmetry between the two. And then how did that happen is the question. <clears throat> and when you try to come up with a theory that explains it, then you're talking about something called a baryogenesis. So it's a genesis of creating matter, but no antimatter. And it has the word barrier, and, and baryon actually is the generic term for protons and neutrons. <clears throat> so how come that we have protons and neutrons in the universe, but no antiprotons and antineutrons in the universe today is the question. 
and try to explain that idea is called baryogenesis. You are trying to generate baryons, but no antibaryons. And Berkeley is a famous place for creating antibaryon for the first time uh, by human being. So up on the hill, there's the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and there was, it used to be an accelerator called the Bevatron. And uh, so that machine was used to create the anti-proton for the first time in history. And uh, the, the two Berkeley physicists received Nobel Prize for this, uh, Emilia Segre and, and Chamberlain. So the antiproton does exist, we can make it, but for some reason, it's not there in the universe in the same way that the electron exists in the universe but not, not, not positron. So uh, that's a, still a major mystery. And if there's some time left, or maybe I can discuss this briefly in the class or possibly in the uh, 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 office hours. Thank you for yeah, the question, be, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions here? Great. So now we'd like to actually talk about this idea called the BCS state. BCS stands for Bodding, Cooper, and Schrieffer, according to people who actually first proposed this. So we actually discussed this a lot. In the case of the boson, you can create this Bose-Einstein condensate, and I told you that it's described by a coherent state. And coherent state is given by this exponential of the creation operator for the boson falling into zero momentum mode, which can be written as a linear superposition of states with different number of particles. And having this different number of particles allowed us to have a coherence because of the number of phase uncertainty principle. And uh, you have seen many data uh, that, that exhibits this coherence. And so that's a uh, system which is very fascinating and, and can be described by this uh, coherence state. So question is, what about fermions? It's clear that you do not have this kind of coherence state because if you do this, then you have linear combination of state is not occupied, the vacuum state, the state that has one particle occupying, but there's no further states uh, because you can occupy the same state with two fermions at the same time. But there is an analog of the coherent state, which is indeed this BCS state. So this can be described in this following fashion to make this analogy clear. So the idea is that if you bring in a fermion with momentum P and another fermion with momentum negative P, as a pair, it doesn't have any momentum. And this pair would behave as a boson overall because we have two, two fermions in it. So if you take this analogy that this B dagger P, B dagger minus P is kind of boson creation operator of net zero momentum, then I can put this into the same expression for the coherent state we use for the Bose-Einstein condensate. So B dagger, B dagger is now in the exponent. And if you can expand this out, then you have this vacuum state to start with. And the first power in F, that's this state over here, where you put in two fermions uh, in a pair of momentum P and negative P. But if you go to the second order in the exponent, that identically vanishes now because you can no longer occupy this momentum state P by the second fermion or momentum state negative P by the second fermion. So this power series expansion would stop here. But this is exactly the state Bardeen, Cooper, and Schwefer proposed for the purpose of describing the superconductor and we'll come back and talk about in, in a few minutes. So you can say that this BCS state is a condensate of some kind, not of a boson, but is a condensate of fermion pairs. And what you do is once you have some Hamiltonian set up for your system, you use this state as an ansatz and compute the expectation value of the energy as a function of this parameter F. And then you minimize that energy and to find what the ground state may be. And so you basically solve for this parameter F for each momentum state to minimize the energy of the system. So this is an idea you probably have studied in quantum mechanics class called variational principle, namely that you take some ansatz for the ground state that might be a, a good candidate. You compute the energy, uh, energy expectation value using that ansatz 
And because the ansatz has some parameter in it, you can try to minimize the energy with respect to the parameter. And then once you minimize it, then using that value of F becomes a good candidate for the ground state. And there's a theorem that says that variational principle can give you a state which whose energy is always at the ground state energy or higher than that. So by minimizing the energy, you can get to a state which is pretty close to what the exact ground state might be. So the idea of the BCS state is that in systems where you have fermions which have attractive force with each other, we used to talk about repulsive force among the bosons, but now we're talking about attractive force among fermions. And in the absence of such a force, then we, of course, know what the ground state should be. You fill up all the states up to Fermi energy. But it turns out that in systems with attractive force between fermions, this BCS state actually can give you a lower energy state, which actually has this little bit of smeared configuration that may, you lose some of the states below Fermi energy, but you gain some of the states above the Fermi energy. So this sharp boundary of the Fermi surface is now a little bit smeared. And then the amount of smearing over here is a parameter called delta, which is often called a gap in the case of superconductor. So this is the kind of ansatz we take. And again, this is the ansatz that's possible only in quantum field theory, not in quantum mechanics, because you are taking linear superposition of states with different number of particles and I emphasize this at the very beginning of the course, that in quantum mechanics, you have to write a wave function with fixed number of arguments, which correspond to the number of particles you have in your system. And it, it doesn't make any sense mathematically to take a linear com combination of a wave function with a Avogadro number of particles in it, and another wave function with Avogadro numbers of particles plus two particles uh, in it. So that doesn't make sense in the case of quantum mechanics, but in QFT, you can do that. And that's how you can come up with this trial ansatz wave function or state, and then minimize the energy to, to look for a good candidate for uh, 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 of, of the, uh, the ground state. And where we now go ahead and apply this idea is the helium-3, as I mentioned earlier. So helium-3 has a nucleus that's made of two protons and one neutron. So that's a fermion. And it's a closed shell as far as atomic levels go because you occupy one S state with two electrons spinning up and down. So atomic physics is very simple. It's a noble gas and it's chemically very inert, but it's a fermion because you're missing one neutron compared to helium-4 we talked about before. And then you introduce attractive interactions and minimize the energy with respect to F. And I don't do this on slides in class, but if you actually look at the lecture notes, you see how that can actually be done. And it's, it's technically a little bit more involved, but nonetheless, it's, the idea itself is straightforward. And so as a result, it turns out that liquid helium-3 actually becomes superfluid-2, and here's the phase diagram. So the phase transition into superfluid happens at much lower temperature compared to the helium-4. So in the case of helium-4, phase transition happens around 2 Kelvin and the helium-4 becomes a superfluid. And we have seen the video of that. But in the case of helium-3, you have to go to much smaller temperature at the level of a millikelvin instead of a, a Kelvin. But nonetheless, it goes through this transition from gas to liquid and then to superfluid. It's a little bit more complicated because there are actually two phases of the superfluid. I come back and mention a little bit about this later on, but anyway, the helium-3 does become superfluid. And the way we describe it is using this idea of the BCS state. Namely, you have one helium-3 atom, which is a fermion, another helium-3 atom that's also a fermion, but pair of them can behave as a boson, and you can create this BCS state using the condensate of this pair of fermions. And then you actually have an expectation value of an annihilation operator because you have state with different number of particles actually in the species state. And that becomes the uh, classical field that shows this uh, uh, the superfluid behavior as we have seen earlier with the, uh, the case of the bosons with helium-4. So here's the idea 
and, uh, I, and, 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 and I will discuss how you can actually use the field theory to describe this uh, on the next slide. But any questions at this stage on the species state? So where does the attractive interaction you mentioned comes from? Like, uh, comes from, yeah. Um, like, it's because they are fermion systems, like they can only like uh, repose each other. So how can they no, that, attract? That, that's not true. The two fermions can attract. And in the case of helium-3, it's basically a van der Waals force. So uh, I, I believe that also something you study in quantum mechanics class, that once you have a, okay. uh, two atoms, both of them are neutral, so there is no Coulomb interactions between them. But if you look more closely, of course, each atom consists of positively charged nucleus at the center and negatively charged electrons in, 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 in outside. So you have a charge distribution, even though as a whole, it's electrically neutral. So the other atom would actually see this charge distribution in the form of electrical dipole. So separation of negatively charged electron and positively charged proton would give you an electrical dipole. And this electrical dipole would also induce electrical dipole in the other atom. They then attract with each other. That's the van der Waals force between two atoms. So two helium-3 atoms would actually attract because of the van der Waals force at the long distance. And I didn't write this here, but the potential energy looks something like minus one over r to the six at long distances because of the negative sign that's an attractive force. But when they actually close in, they start to repel with another contribution to potential that's approximately positive one over r to the 12. So if you plot the potential energy, at the long distances, you see attractive force, potential goes down. But at the, at the small distances, potential shoots up with this very steep power of one of our 12. So they're somewhere in between where the two helium-3 atoms can sort of stay close to each other. So that's the idea of the attractive force between helium-3 atoms, which is the origin of the helium-3 becoming the species state to minimize energy. Does that answer your question, Ryan? Yeah, yes, yes. And okay. so the like the pair these particles can form uh concern like two particles very far away from each other. Right. Rather so than they, like, like combine them into a bound state or something. Uh, that's right. So the BCS states okay. an idea that even though two fermions are not exactly bound, they can still nonetheless form this kind of a condensate. And of course you can talk about the opposite limit. So if the attractive force is very strong you can talk about the, the two fermions becoming bound and then condense. And that's the way you can also have a, a condensate. But, and if you actually recall what we have done with the Bose-Einstein condensate, it's actually the bound state of fermions, as a matter of fact. We talked about rubidium atom. Rubidium atom has a nucleus, which has odd number of protons because it's an al alkali element. So the nucleus is a fermion. And also for the electrons, you have closed shell up to, I think, the fourth row. And then you have the outermost electron. That's a single electron in the S state. So you have the bound state of one fermion, that's an electron, and another fermion, that's atomic nucleus, and it's a boson as a whole. So in that case, you have a strong enough interaction that the fermions bound together to become a boson first, and then condense. And that's what we talked about as a BEC, Bose-Einstein condensate. But BCS is different. The two fermions may not be quite bound uh, from each other, but nonetheless, they work together to create a condensate. And so you can even talk about if you actually uh, gradually change the force of the attractive uh, potential between them, you may switch uh, smoothly go over from this BCS configuration to BEC configuration where fermions bound first and then condense. So BCS is that fermions condense, not without quite getting bound state. BEC is where fermions bind first, become a boson and then condense. And, and then they are continuously connected to each other because just by dialing how strong the attractive force is, you should be able to smoothly go over from BCS situation to BEC situation and that is what is called the BEC-BCS uh, crossover. 
So that's an excellent question, and people are indeed trying to achieve this. And as far as I know, this, had, this crossover had not been uh, seen experimentally, but I may be missing some experiment. So if you actually know of some experimental data about this, actually, I, I would appreciate to know. I looked a little bit, but didn't find it. But theoretically, it's, it's well understood. Great. Yeah, Any, other yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any other questions about this? Um, <clears throat> is the motivation for the particular onsets for the BCS um, just that we treat two fermions as boson? Yeah, or? that's right. Yeah. Okay. So, so we have this system with, of the uh, attractive uh, uh, interaction among fermions. And, and so, you know, people try to come up with the very uh, various ways of looking for the ground state. And the BCS was, of course, motivated to theoretically explain the superconductor. We'll come back and talk about that, that later. And, and then he, they tried all kinds of different things, but none of them really worked. But at the end of the day, they tried this very funny state, which was radical back in those days, because you're taking this linear superposition of uh, states with different number of particles. That was a radical thinking, and it was ingenious because of that. But lo and behold, once they actually took this ansatz, tried to minimize the energy by varying this parameter f for each momentum states, and came up with a candidate ground state. And that was perfect for the purpose of explaining the uh, superconductivity they observed in the laboratory. So, you know, this is in some sense the result of a trial and error, but nonetheless, this is something that actually turned out to be successful. And so that was the motivation to uh, use this funny linear combination of states with different number of fermions in it. Does it make sense? And, and is like, I guess the logic that two fermions, I guess, behave the same as a boson just by the addition of spins so that it's- That's right. Yeah, that's right, right. Because the fermion by itself uh, can't behave like a, a classical wave uh, because it's this Grassmann odd, very funny thing. But once you use a pair of the, uh, um, uh, the fermions, then you can use a boson field, which can take a, a, taken into the classical limit. And that classical limit, as you saw in the BCS state, is really what describes a superfluid uh, uh, in the case of helium-4 or cold atom, uh, uh, cold gas of atoms. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. So the idea is now you're talking about something, I would say composite field. So in the case of BEC, you have a coherent state as a ground state and expectation value of annihilation operator in the coherent state is what behaves as a classical field. And you had actually a homework problem of the coherent state for the harmonic oscillator, that expectation value of the operator in a coherent state is what describes very much classical motion of the tent pendulum. So the idea here is that what behaves as a classical wave to describe a superfluid is actually expectation value of the annihilation operator or field operator. So that was the idea in the case of BEC. In the case of BCS, you have to be a little bit more clever because if you take the, uh, the uh, uh, expectation value of the fermion field, then you get something that's Grassmann odd, and that is not a normal number, which would allow us to describe, for example, interference in showing fringe pattern and so on and so forth. So we need something that behaves bosonic. And, and so in a classical limit, they behave like a regular normal function. So the idea here is simply that you use this annihilation operator or field operator twice. And that's exactly what BCS state allows us to do because the state you're using here has a linear combination of states with different number of particles by even number of fermions, as you saw in the previous slide. You take linear combination of state where for a particular momentum mode, state that doesn't have all the fermions occupied. In a state, you occupy two fermions with momentum P and minus P. So these two states differ in number of fermions by two. And you do this for all the momentum modes. So you end up having all kinds of different states whose number of fermions differ by two units. And if you take the expectation value of two fermion fields using that ansatz, then you get something non-vanishing because these two annihilation operators, namely field operators, 
would annihilate fermions by two units. But the original BCS state has all different components whose fermion numbers differ by two units. So this expectation value would give you something non-vanishing as a result. And then you find an object, which is now Grassmann even. So that behaves like a regular function we are familiar with. And that would describe a classical wave, which is, it turns out to be the description of the superfluid of a helium-3. And once you actually form, uh, look at this uh, boson field now, so I put in the subscript F and B to refer to the fact that Psi F is a quantum fermion field. After you take this expectation value, this is no longer an operator, which is just an expectation value, so it's a classical function. But nonetheless, the system of the liquid helium-3 has to be invariant under Galilean transformation. The, your choice of reference frame is arbitrary, so your laws of physics must be the same, and no matter what reference frame you take. So we now need to write down the Lagrangian for Psi B. Sorry, I actually changed the symbol here. This phi was meant to be Psi B, which respects, respects the Galilean invariance. And that's something we learned how to do using this covariant derivative idea, and so that this is the Lagrangian at the end of the day that would describe Psi B. So this is what I mentioned uh, at one point, I think two weeks ago, that knowing the symmetry of the system is really powerful. This Psi B as an expectation value of two field operators in a BCS state, it looks kind of complicated and depends on what exactly the BCS state may be and so on and so forth. So we don't really know what to do with it at the first sight. But what's powerful here is that after all, description has to respect the Galilean invariance. It shouldn't depend on the choice of reference frame. And that already dictates that the only kind of Lagrangian you can write for Psi B is that of the Schrodinger field. So that's where the symmetry of the system is so powerful. You don't need to know much about the details. This is basically the only Lagrangian you can write. And of course, you can go to, into further details and trying to write them, for example, three body interaction term, psi dagger, psi dagger, psi dagger, psi, psi, psi. That's allowed by Galilean invariance. Maybe it's there, but hopefully it's more suppressed compared to two body interaction. And this two body interaction, as you know by heart now, corresponds to delta function of repulsion between two pairs of fermions now. They maybe have also the, uh, the, uh, the long range uh, uh, potential, then you have to replace this by a long range potential instead of delta function. So there are some details you can improve on, but by and large, this would allow you to have a sort of the zeroth order uh, approximation to the system. So in the end, all you need to know is to how to write down the solution to the equation of motion using this Lagrangian, knowing that it has to be Galilean invariant, for the purpose of describing this fluid, which is this complicated quantum state of matter with the condensate of two fermions. So this is the beauty of quantum field theory. Idea allows us to talk about linear superposition of states of different number of particles, because they are part of this huge Fox space we built in the quantum field theory. And using that BCS state, you can define this expectation value then you try to write down what Lagrangian and equation motion is possible for this expectation value of psi b, but knowing that system has to be invariant under Galilean transformation, pretty much this is all you can write with possible some improvements of introducing long range interaction, higher body interaction and so on. But this, this by and large already is a good discussion for the purpose of uh, uh, describing the superfluid helium-3. So the rest is something you know already, namely that once you have this Lagrangian, you have solved the equation of motion, uh, the order Lagrange equation for this, you find a solution that corresponds to the superfluid <coughs> with a supercurrent, and, and there's no resistivity because it's a supercurrent. We have found this Zalando's criteria that uh, there is no dissipation uh, uh, as long as the velocity is below the critical velocity. And all of that analysis still carries through. And that's the way we can describe the, the superfluid helium-3. Okay, any questions about this? <laughs>
Could you I don't know. Okay, just go, go over? Yeah. Uh, like, again, um, this idea of, like, the, the different, like, a, we're, like, averaging over, summing over um, states with different numbers of yeah. particles, and, like, they're all different by, like, two. So here is the slide I showed on the BCS state. And here we go. So this state doesn't have fermion in momentum P or minus P. This state has two fermions now, one with momentum P and the other with momentum minus P. And first of all, it makes sense to take linear superposition between the two because this state has no momentum. This state has momentum P plus minus P. So this state doesn't have momentum either. So they have the common momentum, namely zero. So adding them up still keeps the same momentum, namely being zero. If you do that with only one fermion, this state would have a finite momentum P. So taking linear superposition with them would make the entire momentum of the system not well defined. So what we want to see is the ground state of this fluid at rest. So we want to make sure that the total momentum system is zero. So that's why we use this pair of the fermions to make sure that you are not changing the momentum of the state. And that way, I used the creation operator of two fermions at once. So this linear superposition has actually has a superposition of state with zero fermion and two fermions. And so far, I discussed this only for this particular momentum mode P. But if you also look at another momentum Q, say, then I again have linear superposition of no fermions in momentum Q or minus Q versus two fermions, again, once in momentum Q and negative Q. So now I have four states altogether in linear superposition, no fermions at all, one pair in P and minus P, another pair in, in Q and minus Q, and both pairs for P and Q. And you keep repeating this exercise for every momentum you can have in this system. So at the end of the day, it's a huge linear superposition of basically two to the Avogadro number times uh, 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 states. So it's a big linear superposition. And again, that's totally impractical using the language of quantum mechanical wave function but using this creation relation operator, all you have to do is to write this state and say, okay, I multiply this for all momenta. That, that's, that's all that takes to write the BCS state in QFT. So that's where you can talk about these, uh, you know, huge state with huge number of states in linear superposition, but nonetheless, you can have this very compact expression to deal with that mathematically and then you can minimize the energy to find the candidate ground state. And that actually turns out to explain this uh, new phase of the liquid helium-3, which becomes a superfluid. Okay, does that answer your question, Anna? Yeah, thank you. Great. And any further question on this idea that because of the fact that we know the symmetry of the system, then the, the, uh, the equation of motion or Lagrangian this uh, classical field psi b needs to obey is basically just given by the same old Schrodinger field theory, which you have seen already many, many, many times by now. Any questions, more questions here? Okay. So I actually skipped over one little detail about the superfluid heating three. And if you're not interested in detail, you don't need to actually follow this through, but it's kind of interesting too. So let me actually mention this nonetheless. So as I said already, in the context of nuclear shell model, helium-3 nucleus is this doubly, doubly magic, which is sort of the closed shell, plus one hole in neutron. So just by knowing this point, you can already tell that helium-3 nucleus has spin one half, right? Because you created a hole in neutron out of this closed shell. So the quantum number of helium-3 is given by just the opposite of a neutron. A neutron doesn't have electric charge, so opposite of that is again neutral. Indeed, helium-3 and helium-4 have the same charge. So relative to helium-4, making a neutron hole doesn't change the charge. 
Hence, helium-3 has charge 2, the same way helium-4 does. But also, the whole of the neutron is the absence of spin 1 half. So if you take neutron spin up away from the system, you create a hole of spin down. But that's still spin 1 half state. So you know just from this observation that helium-3 nucleus is spin 1 half, and that's indeed what it is. So this idea of the, the hole is already useful, that you can determine the quantum number of helium-3 nucleus basically without knowing anything. So that's the usefulness of the whole idea. On the other hand, helium-3 atom is a closed shell atom. So two electrons occupy the one nest state, and that's a closed shell. After all, it's a helium, it's a noble gas. So as a whole, helium-3 nucleus has been one half, but closed shell of the atoms, of course, doesn't have any uh, uh, the net uh, angular momentum being a closed shell. So you can tell the helium-3 atom as a whole is also spin one half. As far as the Van der Waals attraction goes, and uh, you might have seen the discussion of the Van der Waals interaction between two helium atoms, but for the purpose of the discussion, all that matters is the wave function of the electrons. So the Van der Waals interaction is exactly the same, no matter whether it's a helium-4 or helium-3. So helium-3 atoms between them is an attractive force due to Van der Waals. So that's something you also know without going back to the quantum mechanics textbook. So as a result, a pair of a helium-3 atoms can be, uh, sorry, sorry, I, I, I jumped ahead of myself. So, so if you actually bring in two helium-3 atoms together, then this is where you use this Fermi statistics so that the uh, wave function between them has to be anti-symmetric. So there are two possible choices in broad classes. If the orbital angular momentum between two helium-3 atoms is even, then the spherical harmonics of the orbital angular momentum L has a symmetry factor of minus one to the L. And for even L, minus one to the even is plus one. So orbital part of the, the wave function will be symmetric. But we need to make sure that the, the wave function of two fermions is anti-symmetric. The way you can achieve it by putting together two spin one half of two uh, helium three atoms in the configuration of net spin zero, because net spin zero wave function is up down minus down up. And this negative sign gives you minus sign when you interchange to helium three atoms. So even L zero spin is a way of getting the correct anti-symmetric wave function. But another way of doing so is now use odd L, then the orbital part of the wave function is anti-symmetric because it's minus one to the L, minus one to odd number is minus one. But instead you choose spin part of the wave function to be symmetric, like up, up, so that when you interchange the two, there's no sign coming from the spin part of the wave function. So this is another way of getting an anti-symmetric wave function of two helium three atoms overall so you have these two broad classes of possibilities. And which one ends up being the lowest energy state? Of course, depends on interactions between them. But it turns out in the case of helium-3, then there is a repulsive core or the one that was I mentioned earlier. So it starts becoming attractive, but then this repulsive uh, the potential that shoots up when they come close to each other. So two helium-3 atoms want to avoid coming really on top of each other. They wanna keep some finite distance, so social distancing is going on here, right? And, and as a result, to minimize the energy, the even L, like S wave, L equals zero, would bring two helium atoms too close to each other. But if you have L being one, that's the P wave, there's a centri centrifugal barrier uh, that would actually keep two helium atoms away from each other to some extent, then that ends up giving the lowest energy. So it turns out that what forms a condensate in the case of helium-3 is L equal one between two helium-3 atoms, and spin is also one. And, and then you actually have a large number of states. So if you have L equal one, then you have two L plus one, namely three states for orbital angular momentum. When you have total spin one, there are two S plus one, namely three states 
for the spin part of the wave function. So it turns out that this composite field you're going to use to uh, write down the Lagrangian uh, is actually a three by three matrix field. It's not a single component, but you have nine fields altogether built into this three by three matrix. So you write Schrodinger field theory for this three by three matrix. And in addition, you can now also introduce spin orbit coupling and whether this orbital angular momentum and spin want to be anti-parallel or parallel depend on the sign of the spin orbit coupling. And that is the origin of having these two different phases of the superfluid, phase A and phase B in the case of helium-3. And so the, this complicated phase diagram you have seen earlier is because of the fact that you have this rather somewhat intricate nine component field theory with additional interactions that depend on the orbital angular, angular momentum and spin. And so that's why we have more rich phenomenology in the case of the helium-3 superfluid compared to much simpler, the helium-4 superfluid that can be described by just a single component field. So that's a little more detail, which is kind of interesting. And uh, the Tony Leggett, who came up with this theory of describing helium-3 fluid also uh, earned a Nobel Prize because of that. Okay, so this is a detail which doesn't matter for the rest of the class, but if you have any questions about this, uh, you're free to ask now. Okay. All right. Now we'd like to go to superconductor. So the idea of superconductor is that you have electrons in, uh, let's say, niobium metal. And, uh, and then you are talking about how the, you can describe a state where two electrons would condense and form the species ground state. And as I said, sort of the requirement of uh, 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 getting a BCS state is an attractive interaction between two electrons, which sounds counterintuitive here because electron has negative charge and like charges repel. So you would think that two electrons would only repel from each other. But it turns out that in a crystal, it can actually attract with each other. So the idea is this. First of all, the electrons are moving in the background of all these positive ions. So if we have an electron here, what it does is to cancel the positive charge of the ion on the lattice. So in some sense, the electron doesn't carry a net charge, really, if you view it from afar, from the point of view of the other electron. But that was a situation when the lattice was rigid and electron just precisely canceled the charge of positive ion at a given site, then the other electron would not see any electric charge as a net. But the lattice is not completely rigid. It can deform and vibrate and so on and so forth. So as a result, when you actually have an electron near a particular site, then this electron would attract the positive charges of the ions on these lattice sites. So you see the positive charge actually coming closer to the electron. And the net charges was already zero, but now that you bring in more positive charge close to it, so it turns out that this area overall looks as if you have some accumulation of positive charge. So that then would attract the other electron from far away, because the other electron would see this electron surrounded by the cloud of positive ion to have a net positive charge. So that's the reason why two electrons can attract each other. So that's this cartoon over here. And because two electrons now do attract with each other, then they can form this pair that will condense and that's the, the first paper by Cooper alone before the species paper. So that's why this is called the Cooper pairs. So one electron with this cloud of positively charged ions from the nearby lattice sites would look like it has a net positive charge and, and therefore it would attract another electron far away. So this electron and this electron overall then form a pair called Cooper pairs. And it is this Cooper pair that would condense to form the BCS state. 
And that ends up being the correct description of the superconductivity. And again, obviously for this uh, amazing idea, the body in Cooper Schrieffer earned a Nobel Prize. And Bardeen is one of the very few people who earned Nobel Prize in physics twice. He may be the only one person I haven't looked up. Uh, so one of them is this BCS theory of superconductivity. And another one is the discovery of a, a semiconductor uh, for the purpose of the building transistor with it. So uh, he earned two, two Nobel Prize in physics because of that. So BCS state, as far as it goes, is the same as what we talked about in the case of the liquid helium-3. But main difference here is that now the condensate is made of two electrons and therefore has an electrical charge. Helium-3 atom was electrical neutral because of two electrons and two protons canceling against each other. But here we are talking about the pair of two electrons, so the condensate carries electric charge. So what we need to do is to write Schrodinger field theory, as we did in the case of the helium-3, but we need to make sure that it couples the electromagnetism in the correct fashion. So again, we go through this idea I advocated before. So this is the modern view of how you actually use quantum field theory. You specify symmetries of the system. And in addition to Galilean invariance we used in the case of helium-3, now we use another symmetry, which allows the field to couple to electromagnetism. And that symmetry is what is called the gauge symmetry or gauge invariance. And I will review gauge invariance on the next couple of slides, so don't worry about it for now. So whole idea is simply that, okay, we got this field that describes the Cooper pair and write the most general Lagrangian, which respects Galilean invariance and the gauge invariance so that we know how this field couples to electromagnetism. And then we look at the, uh, uh, the, the theory uh, after we have the Lagrangian. So that's the way we approach the problem in the modern view of quantum field theory. So again, let me back up for uh, just a second. So idea is that we now have this idea that two electrons can attract with each other so that they form Cooper pairs. And the Cooper pairs can condense by using this BCS state. But the main difference from the case of helium-3 is that we now write down the Lagrangian for the field, but field now carries electric charge and therefore it should couple to electromagnetism. The way we know how to write the Lagrangian for a field that has electric charge is based on this idea called gauge invariance. I'm gonna review in the next couple of slides. But I hope at least the, the set of steps we take by using these symmetries as a fundamental principle to write out what the Lagrangian can be and then derive the consequence out of the Lagrangian. It's the same step we have been following all the way uh, uh, through. And so I'm just applying the same idea over here. So the only new thing is that in addition to Galilean invariance, we also impose this gauge invariance so that we know how to couple the system to electromagnetism. Uh, any questions about this? Uh, I had a question. Um, I was just wondering, like, so is, is the kind of net positive charge of this mm -hmm. deformation, like, mm -hmm. such that, you know, if we have one more electron, then everything will kind of be neutral again? Mm -hmm. Like, could mm -hmm. we have deformations where the, you know, it's more, it's better to have, like, three electrons or like more electrons to like minimize energy or do we like just want the pairs so that they kind of act as like bosons? Yeah so there can can certainly be uh, the attraction among three electrons or more in principle but as you can see electrical charges small as cancel that's the starting point of discussion and and they get slightly positive charge because of the deformation of the lattice. So it turns out that this attraction we are talking about here is a very, very weak attraction. And because this is really weak, if you think about how the three body state will, will attract each other, that's even weaker. So talking about only two body interaction is basically sufficient for all intents and purposes. Okay. Any other questions here? <clears throat> 
Um, so why is attractive um, like potential or attraction between two fermions, uh, I guess, a prerequisite kind of for the BCS state? Ah, okay. So that's something I didn't show on the slide. So it's just something you can try. So if you have a Hamiltonian where you have repulsive interaction among fermions, and use the BCS state and try to uh, 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 minimize it, the, the end result is that this uh, the coefficient f is either zero, which means state is not occupied, or one, which means the two fermions are occupying it. So even if you go through the same analysis, for the case of a, a repulsive potential, you end up not having this linear superposition of states with different number of particles in it. So the, the previous thing with this rigid Fermi surface, where you occupy all the states up to certain Fermi energy, is good description, it turns out, in the case of repulsive interaction. Does it make sense, make sense, Sahil? Yeah, yeah, and I just had a very quick thing on uh, the lattice. Huh? Um, so is the lattice somewhat loosely bound that a given electron is able to attract surrounding ions? Because I would assume that would be kind of difficult since it's a single electron, but it has enough attractive potential for um, yeah. these bound. Right, effect. right. So the attractive potential is nothing but the Coulomb interaction between this electron and a positive ion on the lattice side. Okay. Yeah, I would just, and, I guess, in when, like the lattice sites are usually considered as fixed, right? Mm -hmm. But right. Is, in this case... But we, kn we know that if you have a metal, a piece of metal, yeah. And you knock on it, then there's a sound, right? The sound is nothing but the vibration of the lattice. I see. Okay. So, so, so we know, yeah. right? So we know it's not completely rigid. So a piece of metal looks pretty rigid to us, but just the fact that you can put your ear on, say, the long ball of metal, somebody else actually knock on the piece over there, then you can see kink, right? So that's the sound. And uh, just the fact that you can actually hear it is an evidence that lattice can deform. It's not completely rigid. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And, and it, it, it eventually uh, people could actually prove that this lattice deformation is the culprit for superconductivity and Cooper pairs because people try the same kind of metal, but with different isotopes so that each of the ion would have different masses, but exactly the same chemical properties, then found the superconductivity, for example, critical temperature to change when you actually go to a different isotope. So what, how much these lattice ions would weigh would affect the superconductivity, and that's an evidence that the formation of the lattice is really respons responsible for the purpose of creating Cooper pairs and let them condense at the end of the day. So this is what is called the isotope effect. Uh, it's the famous experimental evidence for the BCS theory. Any further questions here? Okay, so now we need to review what is the gauge invariance. So this is something you have seen in, in, in classical mechanics and electromagnetism. So when you actually deal with the electromagnetism and solve the Max's equation, we often use the scalar potential and vector potential, which is related to the electric and magnetic fields in this fashion. But I'm sure you learned in, 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 in whatever class you took that there is something called a gauge invariance in it, namely that if you change scalar potential by a time derivative of some function chi, and at the same time, if you change the vector potential to the gradient of the same function chi, then it doesn't change the field strength. And that's something you can sort of verify uh, by your eyes here. So if you change phi by time derivative of this function chi, so this piece changes by gradient of the time derivative of chi. On the other hand, vector potential here changes by the gradient, but it has this time derivative acting on it. So both first and second terms in the electric field changes by time derivative of the gradient of chi with the opposite signs and the change cancels. So by doing this change in the scalar potential and vector potential, you are not changing electric field. 
In the same way, if you change the vector potential by gradient of this function chi, then the magnetic field would change by a curl of the gradient. But as you learn in vector calculus, curl of gradient is always identically zero, just because different derivatives would commute among each other, x derivative and y derivative commute between each other, and therefore there is no change in the, in the magnetic field. So at this stage, it looks like this is just in some sense a, uh, a mathematical artifact of using scalar and vector potential instead of electric and magnetic fields to make the mathematics easier in solving the Maxwell's equation. But it turns out that we now know the scalar and vector potential is actually the fundamental discretion of electromagnetism rather than the electric and magnetic fields. I don't know if you have heard of the Hall of Bohm effect. Does, is this being taught in quantum mechanics class? Can you raise your hand if you have seen it? Okay, many of you are nodding your hands. So the, the fact that a Hall of Bohm effect exists when you send an electron outside the area where you have a magnetic field, but electron going this way, electron going that way, the electrons never experience the magnetic field, but nonetheless, when they interfere with each other, interference pattern would shift according to how much magnetic field there is, which electron has never seen, but nonetheless would lead to a different interference pattern, which is an experimental evidence that fundamental object electron would interact with is actually not the magnetic field, but rather the vector potential. So we know now that the scalar potential and vector potential are the fundamental description of electromagnetism, not the field strength E and B. At the classical level, when you write down this uh, Maxwell's equation, you didn't actually know that. Everything is described in terms of electric field and magnetic field. You don't have to talk about a uh, scalar potential and a vector potential. So at, in classical physics, you could pretend that electric and magnetic field is all there is. You don't have to talk about vector potential, scalar potential. And also the, field, the equation of motion for point particle is written only in terms of the electric and magnetic fields. The, the particles get accelerated by the electric field. Particles feel Lorentz force by the magnetic field. Again, that's described only in terms of the field strength. So we didn't have to talk about uh, uh, the scalar potential and vector potential. So at the classical level, you do have this gauge invariance, but it might have looked like it's just a mathematical artifact by using scalar and vector potential, as long as you keep using the field strength E and B, you didn't have to talk about this gauge invariance at all. But now that we know that scalar vector potential is the correct description of electromagnetism, thanks to the Horn of Bohm effect, then this gauge invariance actually means something. So that's something we need to understand in the case of quantum physics now. So that's the next slide. But anyway, uh, as far as the classical mechanics goes, this is just looks like a mathematical artifact of something. So any questions at this stage about the gauge invariance? I guess this is something you're very familiar with. Okay. So now we look at the quantum mechanics before going to quantum field theory. So you have seen Schrodinger equation of a particle coupled to external electromagnetic field, which is this. I hope you are, uh, this looks familiar to you. So P is replaced by P minus EA with a vector potential. And E times phi is the potential energy, for example, from the Coulomb potential. So that's the Schrodinger equation you solved in the case of, for example, Landau levels for the constant magnetic field or Coulomb potential in the case of hydrogen atom. So this is something that should be familiar to you. And it turns out that when you look at this expression for the Schrodinger equation, it depends explicitly on the vector potential and scalar potential, not the electric field or magnetic field. And we know now that vector potential and scalar potential can change under the gauge transformation. So then it looks like Schrodinger equation is not invariant under the gauge transformation. So the first question is, okay, what's going on? Is it something inconsistent? Well, it, actually it's not. So in addition to changing vector potential and scalar potential, if you also change your wave function by this 
phase factor, which depends on the same spacetime function chi that appears in the gauge transformation of vector potential and scalar potential, it turns out that Schrodinger equation is the same, doesn't change. So the idea is that, again, when you talk about these derivatives, uh, of time derivative and spatial derivative, in a sense that's consistent with the symmetry transformation, you speak of this covariant derivative. We have done that in the case of Gadidean transformation. It turns out that this combination, P minus EA, is one of those covariant derivatives. And so is, if you actually move this E phi to the other side of the equation here, time derivative minus E phi is yet another kind of covariant derivative. And once you actually understand this, it's easy to see why Schrodinger equation actually respects the gauge symmetry or gauge invariance, it turns out. So I show on the next slide how that actually works. But on this slide, the main message is that in addition to change of A and phi under gauge transformation, you also change wave function psi by the same function chi to make sure that the, uh, the, there is a symmetry of the gauge invariance in this system. So any questions about this idea? We will talk about that on the next slide. Is this actually being taught in quantum mechanics class? No, okay, so it's the first time you see it. But I hope you share the first question I, I asked you, namely that once you see the Schrodinger equation, it doesn't depend on the field strength. It depends on vector potential and scalar potential. But we know scalar potential and vector potential can be changed under the gauge uh, transformation. So how come that this Schrodinger equation is okay? How come the physics doesn't change under the gauge transformation? And the answer turns out to be that in addition to changing A and phi, you also have to change the wave function so that physics doesn't depend on what gauge you pick. Whether you pick Lorentz gauge, whether you pick Coulomb gauge, no matter what gauge you pick, physics remains the same by doing transformations at the same time of changing A, changing phi, but also changing the phase of your wave function psi. Is that message clear? Any questions about this? Okay. Oh, Anna, you were just about to speak. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess, so is that a phase shift in the mm -hmm. wave function, mm -hmm. like, insured by the form of the equation? Or do we have to do that additionally when we apply some gauge transformation? I think it's easiest if you see it in action on the next slide. So okay. can I move to the next slide? Okay. So... So what I'm saying is that these two combinations are very special because they are combinations called covariant derivatives. Momentum is a spatial derivative, but once it comes together with a vector potential, it becomes covariant, and you'll see in a moment what I mean by that. And also time derivative by itself is not good, but if you put that together with the scalar potential, then this whole combination is again covariant in a way you're gonna see it in a moment. So the idea is that you change your wave function to uh, the, the, uh, by uh, this phase factor, which depends on electric charge, h-bar, and this function chi, together with this gauge transformation we talked about that doesn't change electric and magnetic field, as you saw in the case of the classical electromagnetism. So you do all these th three things together. If you do that, this P minus EA acting on wave function is now changed to this one where this A is changed and so is Psi. So what's meant by this combination is that I have this derivative together with vector potential, which is now changed to a new gauge by this gradient of chi. But at the same time, this wave function uh, has acquired this phase factor. And when you look at this combination, this derivative can hit not only the wave function psi, but can also hit this function chi in the exponent. And this derivative acting on chi in the exponent will pull out 
gradient of chi in such a way that it cancels this gradient of chi with the opposite sign so that end result turns out to be the old expression without primes on neither vector potential nor wave function, except that there is an overall phase factor up front now. So when you actually have this combination of the derivative and the vector potential, together with this change of the phase of the wave function, all the change there is at the end of the day is an overall phase factor up front. And same goes with the time derivative. So if you change this time derivative together with the scalar potential and change the scalar potential by this gauge transformation, but also change the wave function by the same gauge transformation, then this time derivative can not only hit the wave function itself, but can also hit this function chi in the exponent that will pull out chi dot from this exponent, which cancels this chi dot in the gauge transformation scalar potential. So end result is the same old expression of the original scalar potential and the original wave function, except that you have this phase factor up front. So that's the meaning of covariant derivative. The same thing we talked about in the case of Gadidian transformation. In both cases, we had a particular combination of derivatives in such a way that transformation as a whole ends up being just the derivative acting on the wave function, except for the overall phase factor that comes up front. So exactly the same idea, but now this covariant derivative involves gauge transformation or scalar potential, vector potential, but also the change of the wave function by its phase. So that's the idea that these particular combinations of derivatives and potentials are covariant. Okay, any questions about this slide? Okay, so once you know this simple fact that once you use this particular combination of derivatives and potentials, you get something covariant then you know how this, uh, 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 this uh, how the gauge transformation does not change physics at all. The first one is the original Schrodinger equation. Second one is the new Schrodinger equation, now written in new gauge, where phi, a, and psi are all changed by gauge transformation. But we learned on the previous slide that all these gauge transformations amount to is change the whole thing by your overall phase up front. So even though psi has this time derivative, there's also scalar potential that changes by the gauge transformation. It might look rather complicated, but at the end of the day, all there is is this overall phase factor changing both left-hand side of the equation and right-hand side of the equation. And this is the meaning of this being covariant. So the equation does change, but in a covariant way, namely by overall phase factor everywhere in the equations, then you can just free to cancel this phase factor from both sides of the equation, then you revert to the original Schrodinger equation. So that's the meaning of the statement that Schrodinger equation is covariant. It does change, but only by overall phase factor. So the meaning, physical meaning of the equation does not change because I'm allowed to cancel this phase factor from both sides of the equation. So now we are back to the situation we wanted. Namely, gauge transformation is something you can do. It does change scalar potential, vector potential. It turns out also change the wave function, but physics remains the same because two equations are identical up to overall phase factor. So this is the powerful statement once you know this powerful statement, you know how to write down the Lagrangian for the field that describes the Cooper pair, which has an electric charge. So that's the idea we're gonna use on the next few slides. And I realized I'm running out of time. So let me just get to the punchline. We start from this slide again next week. So don't worry about this missing the rest of the discussion. But the idea is that now you know the gauge invariance you know how to write down its field theory in a way that's coupled to uh, electromagnetic field. 
and that's invariant under these transformations because everything is covariant. And so Schrodinger Lagrangian now is invariant under the gauge transformation. And then you also add, the, uh, uh, then you can work out what, what the equation of motion is. Then you know its solution, which looks exactly the same thing as we have seen in the case of the superfluid. So this describes a super current. In this case, fluid carries electric charge. So this is a super current uh, instead of super flow. And it turns out that you can understand the famous Meissner effect of superconductor using this Lagrangian. So you just add the piece of the Lagrangian which represents electromagnetism. From this, you can derive the equation motion, namely Maxwell's equation. You know what rho and j should be, which you can get from this Lagrangian. Then you plug in the condensate into it. So psi is now a constant. Then you find the electric current as a piece that goes with the vector potential. Then looking at the last Maxwell's equation here without electric field, curl of the magnetic field is now given in terms of current, but current now has this piece that depends on vector potential. And you can solve this equation in Coulomb gauge and you find that the vector potential damps exponentially from the surface of the superconductor. And that's the effect called the Meissner effect namely the magnetic field gets repelled out of a superconductor. So behavior of superconductor can be understood by this Lagrangian. The only thing that's new from the superfluid is now this field has an electric charge 2E in it because it's a Cooper pair. And then the rest just follows by solving the classical equation motion as if psi were a classical field just like what we have done with the Bose-Einstein condensate for a superfluid. So this is the, the part I will actually go through again next week. So don't worry about the details at this moment, but I hope I got across the message here. So by using the principle of the symmetries, you don't need to be worried about the details of the system. Once you know that there's a condensate of two electrons in a pair, you introduce a field to describe it. Symmetries would tell you what the Lagrangian is for that field and the rest would follow. And then you find this prediction that there is a supercurrent and there's a Meissner effect. So that's the way you describe superconductivity using quantum field theory. Okay, let me stop here. Uh, are there any questions about this? Everything okay? Okay, good. So let me finish. Uh, on this slide, and we'll come back and start talking about how to derive the superconductivity from the gauge invariance uh, next week. All right, have a good weekend.